talking about uh, oh, the, some of the marriage practices in Israel, especially Leverite marriage, and we'll see some more of that in chapter 4 as we get into it, and uh, the role of a redeemer and those sorts of things. But before we do that, I want to go over the items I pulled together on this page for you and talk just a little bit about Israelite weddings and how they happened, how they were done, uh, based on what we can piece together. Uh, we don't have a straightforward start-to-finish description of an Israelite wedding in the Old Testament. We have just kind of references to things they did or might have done. And uh, it's not until uh, uh, the time between the Testaments that we really get to know a little bit more about the weddings, and then uh, we learn more also in the New Testament, uh, the way weddings were done. But it probably changed a little bit over time, just as our customs with weddings have changed over time. Let's take a moment and uh, somebody share how you've observed wedding customs change over the years, how things become different in the way weddings are conducted. Bigger or more elaborate. Bigger, more elaborate? Yeah, more money. More money? Yeah. <laughs> outside of churches, more outdoor, okay. different venues. Yes, we're seeing outside of churches more and more in the culture. Don't have shotguns anymore. Don't have shotguns <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, not around here anyway. Not around here anyway. <laughs> they might still be doing that in the hills, Jerry. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. <laughs> They used to joke about having a white shotgun uh, for weddings. <laughs> Any other thoughts? How are, how are weddings changing just in our culture in our day? Everybody gets one or two. Everybody gets one or two. Yeah. So, yes, there's there's been more divorce yeah. in, in uh, recent decades, and therefore um, more marriages have happened as well. Yeah. Come on. More same-sex marriage. That's that's a completely new thing, isn't it? That's a completely new thing that's happening in the culture. Um, so so just as in our time, weddings would have changed over time, and we can observe them. When my mom and dad got married, they got married upstairs. It was a small gathering, and then they came downstairs and 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 had uh, I think like coffee and desserts, and that was that was the reception. <laughs> That's how it was <laughs> when they went through. And today, boy, it is much more elaborate. Uh, how many did we have at our wedding, Susan? Can you recall? Church was full out in Indiana. Yeah? We're both, we're both from big families, so that, that was a factor, of course. A couple of hundred, probably. It was a couple of hundred anyway. Yeah. But to today, the weddings tend to be larger. Uh, the, has it helped? No. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> Apparently not. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not so much the ceremony that that matters. It's it's the relationship between the, the persons. Well, they don't like to have a commitment. They don't commit like they did back. There are factors that have changed, I think. One of them is um, uh, families are not as close-knit as they used to be, and the family, I think, has been there 
to help people and encourage people and work through things that would come up to keep them together and and uh, with families spread out you know for example I'm here in Columbus uh, I've got a sister in Fort Wayne I've got a sister in Alaska uh, even my family in New York uh, is spread out they're all out at least an hour away from each other uh, with among my siblings I think those are those are things that have uh, changed in our culture we're yeah. more mobile move, but move out. We're, we're spread out from each other and therefore we don't we, we're not there for each other in the same way pastor also nowadays these weddings are pre-arranged like it was back then mm. okay <coughs> you mean in biblical times right or? Okay. A lot of them was prearranged. Yes, the families made the decisions. We're going to be looking at some of that information as we talk about the biblical weddings and how they were different right. from weddings today. Today we approach weddings with a with a mind toward romance. Uh, that's very much uh, it's about falling in love and and those kinds of things. And we love that in Western culture. <laughs> that's a big deal to us. Uh, in ancient times, it wasn't as big a deal. It was more about the family's relationships to one another. When I do marriage counseling, I always tell the couple this. Um, uh, you're not marrying a family, but you are marrying into a family. And you've got to factor that in and know the, the relationship to family and what that will mean for your relationship to each other. I don't know, my mother-in-law thought I married family. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think every family's got different expectations, and that's a part of it, isn't it? That's a that's one of the factors. Plus I think a lot of a lot of people are living together rather than getting married today. That has been a big cultural trend. Yes. A very big cultural trend uh, to marry before or excuse me, to live together before uh, actually having the marriage. Um, has that helped? No. It has not. <clears throat> that is not. I know a couple yeah. lived together 20 years, got married, and were divorced three years after that. Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. They got along good with me. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, let's, let's look together at some of the information I compiled here. Uh, there's Bible references there if you'd like to go out and look some of these things up. Uh, but I thought I'd walk us through some of what we know, and it's, and it's kind of limited. So we start there at the top, marriage rights. Among the difficulties for studying biblical marriage is that the, uh, I've got a big word there, the dictionary people, the people who, who tell us how to define words. They know the words that are used for marriage, but they don't always know the reasons that gave rise to the words. We're going to see that as we look at some of them a little more closely, uh, but they often think that the, the what gave rise to these words is uh, the, the marriage practices, marriage rights that uh, went along with them. So let's start with the beginning, Genesis chapter 2. God acts as the father of the groom. So we talked about how an Israelite marriage, how important family was, and the families arranged for the marriage. God arranges the marriage of Adam and Eve, doesn't he? He arranges the first marriage. Um, he acts as the father of the groom and as the father of the bride, presenting her to Adam. You can read that there in Genesis chapter 2. And look at how Adam responds, how, this, how the marriage is sealed. It's sealed with an oath or confession by Adam. Where he says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Okay? So from the beginning, there's something like marriage vows. Okay? From the very beginning, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, there's uh, something like marriage vows that are, are taking place as Adam says these words about who she is, who Eve is, and what their relationship is is going to be alive. Moses then follows up with his own comments. Uh, you can read there. It's a little commentary Moses gives. And he says that a, a, for this reason, a, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. That word cleave is a little bit funny, isn't it? Because we talk about a meat cleaver. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's for dividing things. But here, cleave is used in, in a, the opposite sense. It's used in the sense of to cling to something. And Adam is going to cling to his wife, it says, and then the two shall become one flesh. One flesh. What do you think that one flesh thing's talking about? It'll become one flesh. The bond of marriage? Or? Okay, the bond of marriage. It's, it's in part about sex, isn't it? That's what the husband and the wife, they're going to consummate the marriage, they come together in that way. But it's, it's meant to describe how they're going to be lifelong in this bond. They're going to be one in this way. So, so there is the first example. Um, Moses says uh, that uh, uh, the son's going to leave his father and mother. He's going to leave his parents and cleave to his wife. Shows a new household is being formed, but it also shows the importance of the parents. The family's there, isn't it? And I can envision a little ceremony taking place. Uh, we do this still today, don't we? Where the, the who brings the, the bride down the aisle? The father typically brings the, the bride down the, the aisle, and then the, what's the question the pastor asks? Who gives this? Yes. Who gives this woman in marriage to this man, or however the, the wording is made, and the, the father usually replies, her mother and I. Okay, so you see the role of the parents and the giving of the bride, and it sounds like Moses has something similar in mind as he talks about uh, the presence of the parents and uh, the son leaving the parents to be with the bride, to make a new household, okay? So our marriage practices, I think, have some coordination, some bond with what's going on there in the book of Genesis uh, from the beginning. Okay, patriarchal era, era, in other words, time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, the word for to wed or to marry is actually the word took. Uh, so it'll say things like, Abraham took to himself a wife. Okay, and that's how they that's how they express it. But it's it probably in the background. There's that family agreement thing going on. There's an example of that there in Genesis <coughs> 24. You don't just go take her, right? <laughs> There's negotiations. <laughs> yeah. Also, they used to have uh, the one that wanted to marry the well, would go to the, her his, her family and ask for her hand. Yes. It doesn't happen that so much. Today, and that's similar to what I think here. Yeah, those family discussions uh, maybe are, are less than, than they used to. Uh, maybe, and, and this is, uh, uh, people are getting married at an older age now. So that's, that's another factor. Uh, but they act with more independence, typically. Uh, when the marriages were arranged, it was, it was very much the, the parents yeah. talking it out. <clears throat> and, uh, or something like that. Uh, yeah, there would there would be um, uh, an exchange of goods, and it was different in different cultures. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it's called a bride price or a dowry, and those kinds of things. Um, yeah, the, and the Bible talks about those practices. I didn't include them on this sheet. That's something we've talked about before, I think, with uh, with the marriage with the marriage rights. Maybe when we went through Genesis. Um, so, so you take a wife. Now, in, later on in the books of Moses, it does provide for um, uh, if, a, if, if women are captured in a war situation, they can later on become brides. That can happen. But the law of Moses does some things to protect these women uh, so that it doesn't happen like that. I think okay. that goes on nowadays, too. Or in Iran. I, yeah, I, I think there are parts of the world. Yeah, that's tribal culture, isn't it? Raiding culture. Uh, we have a remnant of that in American <laughs> culture. Um, uh, but but uh, we do it in a comic way. Uh, who's familiar with the Sadie Hawkins Day? <laughs> okay. Uh, this, is, this is something that uh, goes on. Uh, they... 
or, or used to go on, they say, in the, in the hills, but this is where the girls would chase the guys, right? Yeah, so it's, it's turned around. It's raiding culture, but the op the, done in the opposite manner, uh, kind of as a, as, a, as a humorous sort of a thing. When I was growing up in uh, high school, they would have, uh, they had have at the local site, high school, a Sadie Hawkins dance. And at that dance, the girls would ask the guys to dance instead of the other way around. So, uh, so there's a little remnant of uh, tribal or raiding culture in American culture. You got a lot of uh, women want to dance with you? Oh, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, <clears throat> could that could that word "took" be interpreted different ways? I mean, uh, is there in the Greek when they're going from one to the other? Um, it, it, it to, he took a bride is usually the kind of expression that's used there, Jim. And this is a very general word. Uh, it, it's used for you know if you if you if you take a, a sip of water or if you if you take a bath or you know it, it's used in many many ways. The same word, uh, but it's one that commonly comes up when they're, they're describing a marriage. Um, and and it, it's probably referring to that meeting of the of the families that that ends up with the taking away of the bride. Uh, so I think that's the sense of it, that uh, the way it takes place. Uh, let's see. There's another word there that's described in Genesis 11:31, a word for bride or daughter-in-law. And the word literally means to enclose something or complete it. Uh, it's related to the, to the Hebrew word for all, like all things, all comprehensive. Uh, but it may be talking about, uh, about her bridal chamber, they think, as they study this and how the word is used. And uh, that uh, uh, it has to do with the preparations for the marriage and how that would take place. But she is... She is called a kala uh, because maybe because she was in a, a a bridal booth that was called that. Let's see a little bit further on. Oh, this is this is a this is one that's uh, that'll make the men twitch. Uh, <laughs> an early biblical word for marriage uh, uh, for the marriage and marriage rite is kafan, and it describes uh, it's used to describe a father-in-law or the son-in-law, different forms of it used to describe those relationships. And the verb literally means to circle, to circle something. And uh, if you've ever watched a Jewish marriage, one of the things they do is uh, the, group st the group stands at the center and I think the father and the, and the daughter walk around. They circle the groom and they do it seven times. Now, if you, you, I was reading different things about that this week, and it's supposed to ward off bad luck and all of this kind of stuff in, in Jewish popular culture. Um, but uh, you, it makes you wonder what are they, what's really going on there? You know, <laughs> uh, what does this mean? Uh, is, is it the family's way of saying uh, he's kind of sectioned off from every all the other girls, right? <laughs> uh, he's only going to be with this one. Uh, is it something like that? Uh, what does that circling mean? And, and one of the proposals from the, the guys who study this, the, the use of the words, is that it might refer to circumcision, the circling in the Bible. And uh, that the father-in-law, get this, guys, the father-in-law would circumcise the proposed husband before the wedding. Uh, there's a story in uh, the book of Genesis where the, uh, you remember where the, the, the situation with Dinah and there's this young man from another tribe who wants to marry her and they, they agreed that they'll all get circumcised uh, if, uh, if uh, they'll let them intermarry. And then uh, the, the older sons, some of the older sons after they, these guys have been circumcised take their swords and go into the village and kill them all. Um, so it's a very vulnerable situation. 
in that. But they wonder if that circling refers to the circle cut in circumcision. I wonder if it refers to that circuit circling that happens in uh, the later Jewish rite, but we don't have any description of that in the, the books of the Old Testament. I saw a hand going up somewhere. I yeah. Thought, I thought they were circumcised at around, so I thought. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, that's true of um, Israelites after the time of Abraham. The custom was that they would be circumcised and, and typically at eight days old. That's when God commands it. Uh, we know from later situations, though, when the people came out of Egypt, they hadn't been practicing it. And so there's a time when they all get circumcised, uh, described later. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> they talk about commitment, right? <laughs> you want to marry my daughter? <laughs> Let me get the knife. <laughs> no shotgun this time, but man. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can't imagine. <laughs> Let's violate around then. Say again? <laughs> What's the <Mathiolate? laughs> I don't even know. I don't even it's know. Like, uh, it's like, uh, oh, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Something to keep you clean, huh? <laughs> oh, my word. So somehow somehow this, this word gets used. The father-in-law is called the circler. That's, that's how we would literally translate it in English. And the son-in-law is the circled one. So, so what it what it precisely means, they're not sure. But there's probably some sort of a ritual act in the background of this word. Um, and those those are the two best guesses uh, that that uh, I can provide to you. Uh, I think I think. Uh, I can speak for the men here that we'd rather have her walk around us with her dad. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a, that would be the more welcome custom. Yeah, Diane. I have to tell you, I was at COSI one time with the kids, and they showed a video of an actual circumcision. Really? Oh. Ow. To children. Yeah, oh, whoever was there to look, yes, yes. Okay. If I had seen that before I had my son, yeah. I don't know that that would have happened. But <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, that's that's uh, looks really painful. But they say babies forget the pain. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, they, they've been through the stress of birth, which is stressful on a baby as well, yeah. and the mother, no doubt. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, I've heard different ideas about why why they do it at that younger age, uh, but uh, but that's that's what God asked. He said on the eighth day, uh, start the that's when, that's when you circumcise. So, yeah, yeah, ancient <laughs> customs. <laughs> but that really is for cleanliness too. Yes, that's one of the arguments yeah. that uh, yeah, I, that you're less likely to get an infection in that part of the body uh, if that foreskin is removed. And the doctors, uh, you hear both sides on that. Some will argue that that's right and some will say it's not. Um, I suppose when you do the cutting, there's a risk of infection that, that you create at the time. So different, I, there are different ideas out there about it. Uh, there's a medical condition that arises for some men as, as they grow from boyhood to manhood where the foreskin is, is too tight and is like cutting off circulation. And, and that might be how the practice even began. Uh, Israel's not the only one that does circumcision. There are other tribes doing it in the Near East. Uh, but the, there's a need, a surgical need for some for some men that arises as they grow that that has to be cut away, uh, or else uh, they will have additional health problems. So, yeah, yeah, Karen. They, uh, I think there's a study in Africa that the transmission of AIDS in circumcised populations mm. versus uncircumcised is like dramatically different. Like, mm. More than 50, almost 60 percent. Really? It's the, the whole cleaning thing, I think, yeah. is one of the big benefits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, 
I've not I've not read any of those studies, but but that that it, there's some common sense to it. It makes sense that it might not harbor. Men aren't the best cleaners. Men aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I've, I've said before, I'm, sh I'm stunned at the number of men who go out of the restroom without having washed their hands. Yeah. I think, I think, what did their mothers tell them? I, <laughs> not that we're blaming the moms, I think it's maybe these men that are making the bad decision. But go ahead, Jim. All the guys at this table got the methylate. Oh, did you? Okay. <laughs> Way to go. So we won't turn this into a circumcision study. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> but that, that it's a it's a striking it's a striking expression, and they they you know we're dealing with ancient ancient practices and trying to understand them. Uh, Hebrew terms for father-in-law. There's one example in Genesis 38, and for mother-in-law that that shows up later in, in Ruth one. Uh, derived from a word that means to guard or protect. So I think this illustrates the, the binding of the family relationships, that the father-in-law and mother-in-law are seen as protectors to the couple and to those who are married. So that, that illustrates how the families are, uh, in, in, at least in ancient thought, the families are coming together. Okay, uh, Just as parents are responsible for protecting their children, now the, the in-laws are going to share that responsibility, okay? Like I said, you don't, you don't marry a family, but you do marry into a family. And there's relationships that are extended in that, uh, the custom of marriage. Let's see, Exodus. In Exodus, we have the first uh, example of a word for betrothal, the practice of betrothal. Uh, the word literally means appointment, uh, appointing someone to something, and it's it's a legal process there for uh, families or individuals preceding marriage, where they will make the arrangements beforehand. Uh, the families will agree to that. A common practice in uh, in in countries where arranges or arranged marriages happen is that they'll be at least nine months ahead of the wedding. What are they to, uh, trying to do? Make sure, she's not. make sure she's not pregnant. Okay, <laughs> they're trying to make sure she's not pregnant because they want the first children to be from the father or the, the husband. Go ahead, Brian. Um, I had two things. One, what if they didn't want the other person as a spouse? And uh, I forget the second. Okay. <laughs> you mean what if? What if? If the, the bridegroom <coughs> objects? Oh, the second question was, did, I wonder if they even knew that their parents were planning this. Yeah, they did. I, I, I so you can't really answer that. Yeah, I, there, there's an example in Genesis where Abraham sends one of his servants, I think it's Eliezer, he sends him back to his homeland because he doesn't want his son to marry a Canaanite, a son Isaac. He doesn't want him to marry a Canaanite. So he sends the service, servant back uh, to Mesopotamia to find a wife for his son. So it's interesting. It's even, even a, a servant is being entrusted with this arrangement. And when they get there, uh, they meet the young lady who ends up being Rebecca. And uh, uh, they, they sit down and the, the, the servant explains to the family what his mission is and what they're doing. He brings out a bunch of gold stuff uh, to present. This is, this is that, uh, the exchange, uh, the financial exchange kind of a thing that's happening there. And the interesting thing there, Brian, is uh, as the family is agreeing to the marriage, but they ask Rebecca if she wants to go with him if she's ready to travel with this with this servant and she says I do uh, which basically is is uh, you know the guarantee that the marriage is going to take place uh, so so the arranged marriages it's not that the that the children don't get asked or don't get involved somehow or, or have an opinion uh, but the families were expected to make those arrangements 
and uh, and to work with with uh, the in-laws in setting things up. I think one of her first response responses should have been, "Let me see his picture." <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they had pictures back then? <laughs> Yeah, she didn't. She didn't even have a, a family member in front of her to see what he might look like, right? It's a servant. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, see, those those are things that we might be more concerned about in modern culture. Sure. Uh, she she might have asked, well, "How many sheep does he have?" Yeah. See, in, in the negotiations, that might have been a bigger deal uh, than uh, than uh, how does he look. Um, because, because you know, if, if you're in a culture that's living hand to mouth, where you can run out of food next spring and, and starve, your priorities are different, <laughs> yeah. and you see things differently. And uh, and they they were they were more interested often in the economic aspects of marriage. Is he a good provider for our daughter? That was a question. Yeah. Uh, the Christians really copied the way the Jewish... Uh, I mean, when you go get married, it's a unit, unity of the two people. Now, our beliefs and practices about marriage in many ways stem from the Old Testament, don't they? Yeah. We're drawing from uh, what the Israelites were doing in the Old Testament. Uh, the ideas, at least, are there. Uh, but... Uh, you know, the some of the practices that they may have had, we we aren't doing uh, today. We're not doing things in the same way. But we still we still have the giving away of the bride and things, don't we? Those yeah. those are those are remnants of these earlier situations where the parents were more involved in making the decision than they are today. Yeah. Maybe in Rebecca's case, she just had enough faith in God. To he was taking care of. Faith enters into this, doesn't it? Especially if you've not even met the guy and he's in another country. <laughs> uh, the kids, uh, our, our uh, son Caleb and daughter Gretchen, were down in New York City uh, this past week. And they went to Ellis Island and they were looking at all the immigration history. And a, one of the displays down there was talking about these uh, mail order brides. And how they would they would start a correspondence. Um, there would be men living in the states who had come over, immigrated, and then there weren't enough women for marrying here, and so they were there were young ladies in Europe looking for the opportunity to be married, and they'd start a correspondence, and then they would the ladies would come over on the boat, and they would meet them down there at the docks in New York, and uh, be married shortly thereafter. Uh, but they they gave statistics and and the they were talking about how, like up, sometimes up to half the boat would be these young ladies <laughs> coming over and then in, in one case I think three of them married somebody else they, they met they met the guy at the dock and and were like can't take it <laughs> Do, doesn't look right you know maybe maybe that's where the the uh, fear factor or whatever comes in you know <laughs> And uh, they chose, they ended up marrying somebody else, but over here in the states. Yeah. You know, a lot of times these kings would marry into some other family with the you know the power. Mm. Oh sure, sure. Those there were those are factors as well. Uh, you, we talk about marrying up, right? We still talk about that in our culture, oh, yeah. marrying up, and uh, and that's and kings and and that sort of thing. We're looking to marry with people of their. Station or stature, or marry someone who was higher. Yeah. My cousin was colonel in the Air Force, and this other guy, he married three women, Russians, and every one of them left him. Oh, they, oh mercy. <laughs> they just want to become American citizens. Oh, sure. So that's, yeah, that's that's an issue, isn't it? Yeah. They're wanting their green card, as they say. Um, yeah. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? It's hard to imagine arranging a marriage by mail. <laughs> over across the ocean but people many people did it well they got pictures now <laughs> today today you can get a picture uh, but but more important than the appearance of the person is how they're going to treat you isn't it yes 
That will be more important, how they're going to treat you. Because uh, you can keep your eyes closed, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Uh, but uh, but if they if they beat you or or you know badger you constantly, boy, that would be really difficult to deal with. Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure how we got off on all that, but uh, <laughs> but there we go. So so uh, but the practice of betrothal is first described in Exodus. Uh, first mention of divorce is in Leviticus, Leviticus 21, and then in Deuteronomy 24, uh, Moses describes a legal document, that there would be a signed legal document for enacting a divorce. So it's a, very much from that early time a legal process. Uh, the kingdom era, era or the time of uh, the, the kings of Israel, uh, talks about something called a chupa. And if you watched uh, Fiddler on the Roof, you might have seen this thing. And that, that's an example of a Jewish wedding. They set up uh, four posts. Oh yeah. And it makes a little uh, canopy. That's that's what chupa refers to. It's a canopy, and the marriage takes place under that canopy, and it's a symbol of the household. It's a symbol of the household that's being created. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, the groom stands under the canopy and, uh, and uh, one of the Jewish customs is for the, the daughter and the father-in-law to walk around the canopy seven times, okay? We know in the New Testament there's a, a wedding procession that uh, starts, at, uh, starts at the groom's house and then he and his cohort walk over to the bride's house and they pick up the bride there and then they go to like the wedding banquet. Uh, but that's, that was in the New Testament times, we know that was a part of the ceremonies and the way things were done. It may have been happening earlier, but here they, they include that circling travel in the ceremony uh, with a hoopah. Go ahead. Why did they break the glass? Uh, it's, it's, it's another Jewish custom. Uh, it's, not, it's never mentioned in the Bible. It's a later custom, apparently. Uh, but, but that is something that they will, they will do. They, they, they wrap a glass in a cloth and, and stomp it. Uh, I'm not sure what it means, Jim. You'd have to ask a rabbi about that one. It means that the marriage will last longer than it would take to put that glass back together. Oh, okay, that's the symbolism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was aware of the custom, but not of, not of its meaning. Yeah. Yeah. So so he must, he has to stomp it hard to make sure it's really broken up, yes, doesn't it? it? <laughs> the marriage won't be broken. The marriage won't, the marriage won't be broken is the idea. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Interesting symbol. Thank you. Uh, so the the hoopa the hoopa is mentioned there along with the bridegrooms. Uh, Psalm 19 is where that first shows up. Uh, brides and grooms. This is Isaiah talking about these things. Brides and grooms adorned themselves for the marriage. It talks about the 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 groom would wear something like a crown. The the bride would wear uh, different jewelry and things like that. If you've ever seen pictures of Near Eastern weddings, uh, the adornment is a really big deal. They they have wedding costumes, just like we do a wedding dress. That's what's in Western culture, our culture. They would have all this uh, headgear and jewelry and stuff that they would wear into the wedding. Uh, they had special uh, chambers or veils. This is referred to in the, in the book of Joel. We're not sure to how to translate this, whether it refers to a, a chamber like this, uh, like a little tent kind of a thing, or whether it refers to a veil that they're wearing. We're not exactly sure which it would be uh, in, the, in the wedding adornments that you see in Near Eastern weddings, they'll often be wearing a veil over the, over the bride's face. You'll only see her eyes, okay? Uh, this, this sort of a thing may go back to uh, Genesis, though. Uh, when, uh, when Rebecca and Isaac meet in Genesis, she, uh, she sees him at a distance. She asks one of the servants, who is this guy coming? And, uh, and he says, oh, it's, it's going to be your bridegroom. 
and uh, she jumps off the camel and gets her veil on. <laughs> she covers up. Um, and whether you know this connects with this practice or not, I, I don't know. But she she wasn't ready to show him the whole show, I guess, at that point. Um, and then and then there's the situation with uh, Jacob. Jacob marries sisters. You remember this story? So Jacob marries uh, Leah and Rachel. I think I've got the names correct in my head. Leah and Rachel. Uh, and the arrangement of the marriage is he wants to marry Rachel, but on the on the day of the wedding, the father-in-law switches the girls. <laughs> And he, in the morning he gets up, he, he maybe had too much wine too, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> he gets up and discovers that it's Leah that he's actually with in the, in, in the wedding chamber. And, uh, and then the, the, the negotiation starts again. <laughs> hey, what are you doing? Uh, and he has to work for another seven years before he's allowed to uh, marry uh, Rachel. So, so whether whether Leah was veiled that night uh, or what was going on there, uh, uh, you know, it would have been they didn't have uh, big lights and things like that. Whether it would have been too dark for to notice who she was, uh, somehow that uh, Laban, the father-in-law, pulls that all off and uh, switches the, switches the girls. Uh, last, last term I'll mention here, uh, shows up in, in numerous places in the prophets, is uh, a word for husband is Baal. Baal. And that's actually used for the Canaanite, the leader of the Canaanite gods. That's his title, Baal. And it means Lord or husband. Lord or husband. Uh, there's a passage in the New Testament, I think it's in uh, one of Peter's letters, where uh, Peter writes that that uh, Sarah called Abraham Lord, okay? And it's this kind of a, this kind of a thought, um, uh, the, you know, the expression there for the, the wife and husband relationship. And, That's uh, before women's rights. Before women's rights. <laughs> I, Jim, I, my sense is that women have always had rights. I know. Uh, but the, ex the cultural expectations have been different at different times. My wife was the boss. Your wife was the boss? <laughs> okay. Pastor, you're giving my husband ideas. First thing he did when he said that was he leaned into me and he said I can start addressing him as Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's not why I shared that. <laughs> I try. But, but, but Sherry, do you ever call him my husband? Call him husband? Well, hubby. Hubby, hubby, okay. That's about as close. So it's the same kind of an idea that, that it's being used in that sense. It's about the husband-wife relationship. Okay. So, uh, so anyway. <laughs> Uh, so there's there's uh, some pictures of of the kinds of practices that might have been used in ancient Israel as they went to get married. Any comments or questions? We we spent uh, quite a bit of time on that. Uh, we might just get into the beginning of Ruth four. Any comments or questions? All right, clear as mud. <laughs> So, so be, be thinking about all of this as we get into the story here of uh, Ruth and Boaz. Someone read for us verses one through one through three. One through three. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the 
country of Moab is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Okay, let's stop right there. Uh, what's going on here? Well, first of all, where are they? Where are they located? Not the gate. The gate. Okay. Uh, the, the town is probably Bethlehem, and they're sitting in the gates at Bethlehem. Why, why are they sitting in the gate? That's where the judges sat. That's where the judges sat. And so this is, this is like summoning a court. It's like holding a court hearing. And notice what, uh, what Boaz does. He notices going into the town this relative uh, that's closer in relationship to Naomi and, and her family than he is. And so he stops him and has him sit down. Then what does he do? He goes and gets ten men. He goes and gets ten men. Why does he do that? Witnesses. Witnesses. Very good. It's like witnesses or even, or they could even get involved like a jury in making a judgment. And they sit down and they're going to hear the situation. Uh, but they definitely had to have somebody witness this. this. Uh, you remember, there's uh, literate people at this time in the culture, but a lot of them are not literate. They don't, they don't read and write. Pastor, my footnotes here say it's elders. Elders, okay. Amen. Yes. So they can judge. Yes. So, so it's going to be, uh, the word elder in Hebrew refers to the beard. Zakan. It, it literally means a beard. A bearded <coughs> one. So there are people who are old enough to serve as elders or judges. Okay? In the situation. And... Uh, uh, you can't write, uh, or they wouldn't necessarily write all of this down, but they would depend on the community memory. Okay, so instead of having one notary republic, or notary public, who writes out, you know, and testifies and stamps something with the seal of Ohio, they have ten gather and watch it all, and then now it's locked into the community's memory. They'll know this happened okay so that's that's what they're up to here um, any questions or comments so far let's read on now let's see how the proceedings go verses 4 through 6 if someone would read so I thought I would tell you of it and say buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I, and he said, I will redeem it. Let, let's, Karen, let's stop there. Let's stop there. Is, it, is any of this about a wedding yet? It's about land, isn't it? Okay, it's about land so far, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, what's, whose land is it? It's named from Little X. Okay, it belonged to Elimelech, her husband, but Naomi, as the widow, is the one who has possession of it, more or less. Okay, she's, she's the one connected to that piece of property. Uh, so it's all about, a, a, about redeeming her land. Uh, so what the redeemer would do is he would pay out a certain amount for that land, redeem it on Naomi's behalf, but then he would also have rights to the use of the land. Okay? So, so it's very much a financial transaction at this point. Um, he's going to uh, redeem, redeem the land and, and get the use of it. Uh, does he want to do it? He's duty bound to do it, isn't he? And he says, I will redeem it. He's ready, he's ready to make this commitment on behalf of the family. Let's read on now, verses 5 and 6. Then Boaz said, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Mm. Mm. So why is he backing out now? 
Because there's uh, there's attachments. <laughs> <laughs> there's attachments. Why why would that be such an entanglement? Why? He has to split the inheritance. If he has children with Ruth. Yeah. If if he uh, if he marries Ruth and Ruth has children, who's going to inherit the property? Children. The children. Not his children, not his family, hmm. but those descendants of Elimelech will inherit the property. So suddenly, the deal doesn't look so good, does it? <laughs> the deal doesn't look so good, and he's and he uh, he's gonna he's gonna take a step back then, and uh, and he's saying he's saying to Boaz. Your turn. <laughs> Your turn. Questions? Yeah. In modern day terms, is this like a prenuptial agreement? <laughs> <laughs> is that where they get this from? A prenup. Um, uh, it, it's certainly agreement that's taking place before the wedding. Yeah. Yeah. But our, our modern prenuptial agreements don't happen like this. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, and, the, and they're done for different reasons. I think here here it's about protecting the family rights of Elimelech and Naomi and their offspring that's that's what it's about and this goes back to the law of Moses and and uh, they wanted that preservation of the families and that the families would have land to care for their families because uh, once you use the land the best you can do is be a servant so that, and that locks you into a difficult situation economically. Puts, it puts you lower in the culture. And so this is about protecting that family. Uh, take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it, he says. He's not willing to pay out to protect the family or protect the extended family uh, at the risk of, of uh, what it means for his own family. Okay? Um, maybe we should stop there because <laughs> the bell is rung and we'll pick up then at verse 7 for next week let's bow our heads and have a closing prayer Heavenly Father we thank you for the gift and blessing that holy wedlock is we pray for each and every household represented here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church that you would strengthen the marriages strengthen those bonds strengthen the families in support of those bonds and encouragement. We also pray for our young people, Lord, the many, many children we've baptized here in recent years who are, who are going to be coming to that practice and decision about marriage. We ask that you would give them wisdom and guidance, O God. Bless the families to guide them and to keep marriage sacred. We also pray that Emmanuel may be a household for marriages in the coming years as these children mature. Through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks very much, folks.